Jimmy Swaggart was the essence of a modern-day evangelical powerhouse, charismatic, influential, and unafraid to proclaim the gospel. From the pulpit to the recording studio, his presence was felt in the world of televangelism, attracting listeners with his fiery sermons and soul-stirring songs. However, under the veneer of spiritual enthusiasm and fame was a story as complex as it was tragic, one of the successes overshadowed by personal hardships and moral issues. Let's see where it all went wrong. Early Life On March 15, 1935, Jimmy Lee Swaggart was born in Faraday, Louisiana, into a family with deep roots in music. His father, Willie Leon Swaggart, popularly known as Son or Son, was not only a fiddle prodigy but also a Pentecostal minister. Meanwhile, his mother, Minnie Bell Heron, came from a sharecropping family with deep roots in the South. The Swaggart family's extensive web of links, where cousins and in-laws intermarried, resulted in a close-knit community like a densely woven ball of rubber bands. Swaggart discovered connections to musical icons within this familial tapestry. His extended family included his cousin, famed rockabilly pioneer Jerry Lee Lewis, as well as country music luminary Mickey Gilley. Swaggart's sister, Jeanette Ensminger, also contributed to the family story. Swaggart was raised in the embrace of local Assemblies of God congregations in Faraday and Wisner, and he was immersed in Pentecostal traditions from a young age. He nurtured his musical talents within these church walls, frequently performing alongside his father, who was a pastor at the local Assembly of God Church. Swaggart married Francis Anderson, a fellow congregant he met at Wisner's church in 1952, when he was only 17 years old. Their union reflected a lifetime of shared joys and hardships. Swaggart began to share his musical talents with audiences outside of the church doors, singing Southern gospel songs at numerous congregations as he worked odd jobs to support his small family. The Swaggart family experienced adversity and perseverance during the 1950s, as documented in Jimmy Lee Swaggart's autobiography, To Cross a River. Swaggart, his wife, and his kid faced the hard realities of poverty while living on a mere $30 per week, which, today time, converts to $300. Their lives were distinguished by continual movement as they moved between church basements, pastors' homes, and inexpensive motels, never remaining in one spot for long. During these trials, Swaggart was provided with an enticing chance. Sun Records' renowned producer Sam Phillips aspired to broaden the label's range by branching out into gospel music. Swaggart's cousin, Jerry Lee Lewis, was already experiencing huge success under the Sun Records label, so Phillips regarded Swaggart as a viable addition to his roster. The offer promised financial security, with Swaggart having the opportunity to make a significant salary for himself and his family. Swaggart did, however, make a disastrous decision that would set the course of his life. Despite the pull of fame and wealth, he declined Phillips' offer, firm in his belief that he was called to a greater cause. Swaggart believed that his destiny belonged in the pulpit, not on stage. It was a decision based on his strong faith and unshakable commitment to his calling as a gospel preacher. Swaggart's refusal to compromise his convictions in pursuit of worldly prosperity became a recurring theme throughout his life. Throughout the years that followed, he faced numerous difficulties and tragedies, both personal and professional, but he always emerged with his faith intact. Early Career Jimmy Lee Swaggart went on his full-time evangelical mission in 1955, armed only with a donated flatbed trailer. From this humble beginning, he disseminated the gospel message far and wide, visiting the American South and gaining a devoted following along the way. It was the start of a lifelong endeavor to provide hope and salvation to the masses. Swaggart's reputation as a fiery preacher and charismatic speaker rose, and he stretched his influence across other channels. In 1960, he made his musical debut, creating gospel recordings that appealed to audiences seeking spiritual nourishment. Simultaneously, he used the airwaves to spread his message of faith and salvation through Christian radio stations, setting the groundwork for what would become a massive multimedia ministry. Swaggart's passion and commitment to his calling were officially recognized in 1961, when the Assemblies of God ordained him. This watershed moment marked the official start of his ministry, launching him on a path to increased fame and influence in the evangelical community. Swaggart's vision expanded even further in the late 1960s, when he constructed the Family Worship Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. What began as a small congregation grew into a thriving church community 
founded on the concepts of faith and worship. Over time, the Church's association with the Assemblies of God grew stronger, confirming its place within the greater framework of Pentecostal Christianity. Swaggart took another brave move forward in 1971 when he launched a weekly program that aired across the country. His program, which aired on multiple local television stations in Baton Rouge, enthralled audiences with compelling messages of hope and spiritual rebirth. Swaggart further expanded his influence on the airways by purchasing a local AM radio station, WLUX. He provided a wide range of programming on this platform, from Christian feature stories to impassioned sermons, catering to a broad spectrum of fundamentalist and Pentecostal churches. The station also became a hub for gospel music, offering listeners inspiration and peace via singing. Swaggart's ministry evolved during the 1980s and early 1990s, responding to changes in the media and technology world. Recognizing the changing tide, he made the strategic decision to sell many of his radio stations, allowing him to concentrate more on his core purpose of proclaiming the gospel to the masses. Despite the difficulties of the modern era, Swaggart stayed constant in his dedication to sharing the message of God's love and redemption, unaffected by the problems that lay ahead. Shifting to Television By 1975, Jimmy Lee Swaggart's television ministry had expanded to include multiple stations across the United States. Swaggart made television his principal platform for preaching the gospel realizing its enormous potential as a means of spreading his message. In 1978, the weekly webcast was extended to a full hour, giving Swaggart the opportunity to go deeper into his sermons and communicate with his audience on a more fundamental level. The 1980s brought a new era for Swaggart's ministry, one of creativity and expansion. In 1980, he established a daily weekday program combining Bible study and music to provide viewers with spiritual nutrition and inspiration. Jesus heard, he heard my humble. Meanwhile, the weekend telecast, which lasted an hour, included services held either at Swaggart's own family worship center or at on-site crusades in major cities around the country. This dual approach enabled Swaggart to maintain a consistent presence on the airwaves throughout the week, catering to his audience's different requirements. Swaggart's television broadcasts grew in popularity throughout the 1980s, reaching major cities across the country. The telecasts were well-received by audiences from all walks of life, owing to their compelling messages of faith and salvation. By 1983, Swaggart's television ministry had expanded to over 250 stations across the country, ensuring that his voice could be heard in households from coast to coast. Swaggart's television ministry paralleled the broader cultural environment of the 1980s, which saw the expansion of evangelical Christianity and the growing influence of religious programming on television. Swaggart's captivating demeanor and dynamic preaching style enthralled audiences, bringing them into his ministry and reigniting their interest in spiritual topics. Promotion of Mozambican National Resistance Throughout the lively evangelical environment of the 1980s, the advent of Jimmy Swaggart Ministries constituted a watershed moment in American religious history, with its impact reverberating not only in spiritual, but also political areas. As evangelical enthusiasm swept the country, Swaggart grew to prominence, exerting significant power and influence. However, among the fire of religious devotion, Swaggart found himself mired in controversy because of his involvement with the Mozambican National Resistance, a group implicated in Mozambique's protracted civil war, which lasted 15 traumatic years. Mozambican National Resistance, accused of committing heinous war crimes during the conflict, found an unexpected supporter in Swaggart Ministries, which not only provided spiritual support, but also served as a PR platform. Allegations appeared indicating that Swaggart Ministries went above and beyond, providing financial and material support to the group. The scope of this collaboration was revealed spectacularly in September 1985, when government forces, assisted by Zimbabwean involvement, took Mozambican National Resistance's main stronghold, Casa Banana, in Mozambique. Among the stunning findings amidst the rubble were piles of Swaggart's 1982 book, How to Receive the Baptism in the Holy Spirit translated into Portuguese, an astonishing revelation that sparked inquiry and triggered inquiries. 
During the 1988 conviction of Australian missionary Ian Gray, who played a key role in coordinating private help for Mozambican national resistance, charges surfaced involving Swaggart Ministries, which operates through Shekinah Ministries, in enabling Mozambican national resistance aid. However, amid the clamor of media attention surrounding Swaggart's involvement in a scandal that same year, these allegations were overshadowed and pushed to the margins of public perception. Nonetheless, in 1991, both Covert Action magazine and the Zimbabwean government renewed claims against Swaggart Ministries, alleging continued financial assistance for Mozambican national resistance. These allegations threw a pall over Swaggart's evangelical empire, raising ethical concerns about his involvement in geopolitical conflicts far from the purity of the pulpit. Swaggart's affiliation with Mozambican national resistances sparked controversy highlighting the complex interplay of religion, politics, and humanitarianism in 1980s evangelical America. Many observers saw Swaggart's affiliation with an organization involved in serious human rights crimes as diametrically opposed to the gospel of compassion and righteousness he preached from his broadcast pulpit. Despite the claims and subsequent examination, Swaggart maintained his formidable status in the evangelical world, holding considerable power through his vast media conglomerate. By the mid-1970s, his television ministry had grown into his principal platform, reaching millions of people across the country and beyond, cementing his reputation as a household name in American Christianity. Swaggart stretched his reach even further in the 1980s when he launched a regular weekday show that included Bible study and music. Weekend programs, which lasted an hour, frequently featured services from Swaggart's Family Worship Center or crusades staged in big cities, demonstrating his growing popularity and the broad appeal of his message. 1988 Scandal Few personalities in American evangelicalism have garnered as much attention and controversy as Jimmy Swaggart. His fiery sermons and charismatic presence propelled him to the pinnacle of Christian glory, but it was the scandals that shook his ministry that cemented his name in infamy. One such controversy, including accusations of prostitution and a dramatic public confession, serves as a sharp reminder of the complications at the confluence of faith and human frailty. Swaggart's downfall can be traced back to 1986 when he had a severe feud with fellow Assembly of God minister Marvin Gorman. Swaggart, by accusing Gorman of marital adultery, unknowingly put in motion a chain of events that would eventually end both men's careers. Gorman, who had been stripped of his ministerial qualifications and effectively banished from the Assemblies of God, responded by filing a lawsuit against Swaggart, alleging defamation and conspiracy. The legal battle that followed resulted in a significant verdict against Swaggart, with Gorman given damages of $10 million. However, a subsequent settlement lowered this sum to $1.75 million. Gorman, seeking retaliation for what he saw as a terrible injustice, organized a covert operation to expose Swaggart's own moral flaws. Gorman charged his son Randy and son-in-law Garland Bilbo with surveilling Swaggart. Their investigation led them to the Travel Inn on Airline Highway in Metairie, a suburb of New Orleans, where they discovered incriminating evidence of Swaggart with Deborah Murphy, a local prostitute, outside Room 7. Armed with this devastating evidence, Gorman faced Swaggart, laying the groundwork for a clash that would resonate throughout evangelical circles. In order to contain the mounting issue, Gorman reportedly reached an agreement with Swaggart, offering him a shot at redemption in exchange for public apologies and efforts to restore Gorman's reputation within the Assemblies of God. Swaggart, realizing an opportunity to save his reputation, consented to the requirements, albeit grudgingly. However, as the date for Swaggart's promised apology came, he stayed silent, forcing Gorman to take action. On February 16, 1988, Gorman revealed Swaggart's relationship with the escort to James Hamill, a member of the Assemblies of God leadership, triggering a chain reaction that eventually led to Swaggart's demise. The discovery of Swaggart's crimes caused shockwaves throughout the evangelical community and the general public. Murphy's reliability was called into question, particularly after she failed a polygraph test given by a New York City Police Department specialist. Questions about her motivations and integrity put doubt on the nature of her relationship with Swaggart, complicating an already tumultuous story. Despite her claims of innocence, Murphy's narrative made its way into the public sphere, with publications like Penthouse Magazine exploiting the juicy details for titillating headlines. 
However, Swaggart's televised confession on February 21, 1988, would come to characterize the scandal in the public eye. Swaggart addressed his family, congregation, and a captive television audience, shedding tears and admitting his sins without going into detail. His passionate plea for forgiveness, interrupted by earnest pleas for redemption, moved many people, providing a heartbreaking reminder of the fragility of human nature and the power of divine grace. Despite his public apology, Swaggart's problems were far from ended. The Assemblies of God, unmoved by his weeping confession, increased his suspension to the customary two-year penalty for sexual immorality, eventually defrocking him and cutting all links with his ministry. Undeterred, Swaggart began a new chapter by launching Jimmy Swaggart Ministries and the Sun Life Broadcasting Network. Based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, these organizations provided a forum for his continued work, albeit outside of denominational authority. Swaggart's picture, which brought him to tears as he admitted his sins, is indelible in the public consciousness, a disturbing warning of the dangers of unrestrained pride and the consequences of moral failures. Despite the scandal and embarrassment, there is a ray of hope for redemption and renewal, demonstrating the strength of faith in the face of adversity. Swaggart's story, while symbolic of the televangelist scandals of the late 1988, serves as a cautionary tale for both believers and non-believers. It serves as a reminder that even individuals in positions of religious leadership are not immune to the limitations of the human condition. 1991. Scandal. On October 11, 1991, Jimmy Swaggart's tortuous journey took another tragic turn when he was discovered with an escort for the second time. The incident occurred in Indio, California, where Swaggart was stopped by a police officer for driving on the wrong side of the road. Alongside him sat Rosemary Garcia, who later told reporters about her meeting with Swaggart, stating that he had approached her for adultery by the roadside. In her own words, she said, he asked me for things. I mean, that is why he stopped me. That is what I do. I am an escort. Unlike his earlier offense, Swaggart chose not to address this latest infraction personally to his congregation. Instead, at the family worship center, he gave a curt message saying, the Lord told me it's flat none of your business. This sudden dismissal of culpability was a departure from his past public confessions, indicating a change in his attitude to dealing with personal shortcomings. Following the controversy, Swaggart's son, Donnie, took the pulpit to make a sorrowful statement to the congregation. He notified them that his father would be stepping down from his leadership position at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries for a period of healing and counseling. This decision highlighted the gravity of the problem and the necessity for Swaggart to address not only the consequences of his acts, but also the root causes of his recurring moral failings. Swaggart's second brush with prostitutes had far-reaching consequences not only for his ministry, but also for the Christian world as a whole. It tarnished his legacy and called into question his suitability for church leadership. Many of his followers had a moment of reckoning, forced to confront their spiritual mentor's fallibility and the ramifications of his conduct for their religion. Swaggart found himself at a crossroads in the midst of the ensuing chaos, debating the repercussions of his decisions and the path forward. The decision to resign from his ministerial duties was a watershed moment of reflection and soul-searching. It was an awareness of the need for personal reform and a determination to seek redemption, not just in the eyes of his congregation, but also in the eyes of God. As Swaggart stepped away from the spotlight to begin a journey of self-reflection and repair, the world waited with bated breath, unsure of what the future held for the disgraced evangelist. Aftermath The scandals that shook Jimmy Swaggart's ministry in the late 1980s and early 1990s had a lasting impact on his career and legacy. As the dust settled, Swaggart found himself at a crossroads, dealing with the fallout while attempting to save what remained of his once thriving ministry. Despite the damage to his reputation, Swaggart remained committed to his aim of spreading the gospel through television. In 1973, he offered a revolutionary idea to television producers in Nashville, Tennessee, a show that blended music performances, brief sermons, and updates on ministry projects. To his pleasure, the producers accepted the concept, and thus, the Jimmy Swaggart telecast was born. Within weeks, the program was broadcast into homes across the United States, launching Swaggart's rise to notoriety as a televangelist. Swaggart, buoyed by the success of his show, increased his reach in 1981 by launching another daily program called A Study in the Word. 
The program, which aired on cable channels such as CBN Cable, TBN, and the PTL Network, presented viewers with in-depth biblical teachings and insights, adding to Swaggart's reputation as a dynamic preacher and theologian. However, Swaggart's spectacular ascension was not without challenges. Swaggart was undeterred by the 1988 setbacks, and he continued to preach and broadcast his message of redemption and salvation. However, the cloud of controversy, which came in 1991, caused serious damage to Swaggart's reputation as a traditional televangelist. As more local TV stations cut relations with him following a second prostitution scandal, Swaggart's once-thriving television empire began to unravel, forcing him to deal with the consequences of his conduct and the erosion of public trust. During the upheaval, Swaggart attempted to refocus his ministry. At 1984, he founded Jimmy Swaggart Bible College with the goal of training future pastors and promoting his evangelical message. Initially providing degrees in education and communication, Jimmy Swaggart Bible College experienced a boom in enrollment as aspiring pastors sought to learn from Swaggart and his team of teachers. However, the problems that surrounded Swaggart in 1988 did significant damage to Jimmy Swaggart Bible College's reputation and enrollment numbers. Students, disillusioned by their mentor's fall from grace, fled the college in droves, resulting in accreditation concerns and a steep drop in enrollment. In order to weather the storm, Jimmy Swaggart Bible College underwent a series of modifications, culminating in its renaming as World Evangelism Bible College 1991. Despite efforts to revive the institution, enrollment continued to decline, forcing the college to make difficult decisions about academic programs and staffing. By the end of 1991, Jimmy Swaggart Bible College had experienced considerable downsizing, with once thriving departments closed and academic members laid off. Swaggart's aim of establishing a flagship institution for evangelical education had been destroyed, forcing him to face the sobering reality of his lessened influence and the lingering taint of controversy on his legacy. Later Career Jimmy Swaggart and Francis Swaggart, previously Francis Anderson, born August 9, 1930 even, have been married since October 10, 1952. They have one son, Donnie, who was born on October 18, 1954. Donnie's name is a touching memorial to Jimmy Swaggart's late brother, who unfortunately died in infancy. The Swaggart bloodline continues via Donnie, with three grandkids and several great-grandchildren contributing to the family tree. The Swaggart family has been involved in ministry for centuries, leaving a spiritual legacy. Donnie Swaggart, following in his father's footsteps, has accepted the call to preach, as has his son, Gabriel Swaggart. This succession of preachers represents the continuation of a sacred tradition, with four generations of Swaggarts dedicated to God's service. As of 2007, Jimmy Swaggart Ministries' enormous reach included a wide range of venues and programs, functioning as a beacon of spiritual advice and inspiration. At its heart is the Family Worship Center, a sanctuary where believers can worship and converse with the divine. In addition to this actual congregation, there are other media sources, including the Jimmy Swaggart telecast, which is a cornerstone of the ministry's outreach activities. Radio and television programs like A Study in the Word and the Sun Life Radio Network help to spread the ministry's message by airing the teachings of Jimmy Swaggart and his respected guests to a large audience. In the digital sphere, a dedicated website serves as a resource and information hub, expanding the ministry's reach to the far corners of the world. The Sun Life Broadcasting Network, a 24-hour cable and satellite television network, is a key component of the ministry's multimedia presence. SBN provides viewers with access to a wide range of programming, including live broadcasts of services at the Family Worship Center, informative Bible studies, and inspirational messages presented by a number of notable speakers. Frances Swaggart, a revered figure in her own right, contributes her voice to the ministry via her television show, Francis and Friends. This daily offering on SBN serves as a forum for conversation and fellowship, promoting a sense of community among believers. Meanwhile, Jimmy Swaggart is still actively involved in ministry, conducting a daily Bible study program on SBN called The Message of the Cross. This program, distinguished by its deep examination of Scripture, acts as a beacon of spiritual illumination for audiences all around the world. In addition to his television work, Jimmy's son, Donnie Swaggart, plays an important part in the ministry, preaching regularly at Family Worship Center and ministering to congregations across America and beyond. Similarly, Donnie's son, Gabriel Swaggart, 
exemplifies the spirit of youth and dedication by serving as the ministry's youth pastor and directing Crossfire Family Worship Center's thriving youth ministry. As of 2023, Jimmy Swaggart continues to lead Family Worship Center, encouraging congregants on their spiritual journeys and inspiring believers all around the world to accept the transformative power of God's love. His strong dedication to ministry exemplifies the Swaggart family's long-standing tradition of faith and devotion. Legacy Jimmy Swaggart's legacy is a remarkable story filled with achievements, disputes, and problems ranging from philanthropy to music, television, religious discourse, and personal struggles. At the heart of his legacy is a desire to make a positive difference in the world, as seen by his humanitarian efforts, creative accomplishments, and involvement with theological and moral issues. Swaggart's ministry has had a lasting impact on the lives of many people, providing hope, assistance, and resources to those in need all around the world. One of the most visible components of Jimmy Swaggart's legacy is his humanitarian efforts. For decades, his ministry has supported orphanages and outreach programs in Mexico, Haiti, and Uganda. These efforts have offered refuge, education, and care to impoverished children, giving them a chance for a brighter future. Swaggart's organization has also been in the vanguard of disaster relief operations, mobilizing resources to help areas impacted by natural disasters. Whether it's storms, floods, or earthquakes, Swaggart's ministry has responded with compassion and charity, offering necessary supplies, shelter, and medical attention to those in need. Beyond immediate relief operations, Swaggart's ministry has engaged in long-term community development programs to help individuals and communities enhance their quality of life. Initiatives such as clean water projects, vocational training programs, and agricultural development efforts have given communities the tools and resources they need to thrive independently. Swaggart's philanthropic donations have had a long-term influence on the communities they serve because they target structural challenges and develop sustainable solutions. In addition to his philanthropic efforts, Jimmy Swaggart is well known for his contributions to gospel music. His powerful CDs, which feature worship and praise songs, have earned him many Grammy nominations as well as Dove Award honors. Swaggart's music connects with audiences all over the world providing solace, inspiration, and spiritual nutrition to people of all backgrounds. Swaggart's musical talents have helped define the landscape of Christian music, establishing a legacy that continues to inspire both musicians and audiences. Swaggart's innovative use of television as a platform for sharing the gospel has also gained him praise and respect in the field of religious broadcasting. His shows reach millions of people around the world, delivering a message of faith, hope, and redemption to a varied audience. Swaggart was inducted into the Religious Radio Hall of Fame in appreciation of his services to Christian radio, establishing him as a pioneer in the sector. However, Jimmy Swaggart's legacy is not without controversy and obstacles. Throughout his career, he has been scrutinized and chastised for his personal actions and moral faults. Public scandals have marred his reputation and called into question the integrity of church leaders. Despite these losses, Swaggart has sought personal and professional redemption. His journey of repentance and reconciliation demonstrates the power of grace and forgiveness in the face of adversity. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.